count of three when children open the shoe boxes. They're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The gospel is advancing. It is impacting children. It is impacting families. It is impacting the world greatly. Thank you for praying. Thank you for giving. God will bless, and God will use your gift to touch the life of a child and to be able to do it in Jesus' name. So thank you. Thank you for being a part of it. God bless each and every one of you. Good morning, church family. We're here again today to tell you some more specific details about our fall festival. When our cars first arrive, they will enter through Gabin Way, and that's where they will receive this bag with a gospel track inside of it. And they will also receive a CD with music, instructions, and the gospel presentation on their CD for them to listen to as they drive through our parking lot. Yes, we want to make it as personable of an experience as possible. So then they'll come around and loop around the cul-de-sac behind the nursery area and come up behind the fellowship hall where our food ministry team will be there to um, give them their bag supper, which will be a hot dog, a grilled hot dog, a um, bag of chips, a yummy dessert, and a bottle of water. So that's when they will, once they receive their food, they'll come around to where our, they'll loop around the back of the parking lot and come through to where our booths are. And now our booths will be in the same spot where they normally are, except for they will be on both sides, front and back. And the cars will loop through both areas to make sure that they drive by both sets of booths to see everybody. Yes. So let's talk a little bit more about our booths. We're asking you, those who've signed up, um, to de decorate your booth. That can be the back of your car, your truck, a, t a church tent, however you want to decorate. Um, you just decorate that booth, and that booth, excuse me, and you will be handing out candy to children in their cars. So there will be no exchanging of a ball or any kind of activity. It will only be you with a gloved hand, a safety mask on placing the candy into their bags. So we want to talk a little bit about why Fall Festival is so important and why we do this. And we do it to offer love to our community. And this year especially is an important time for us to be able to show love to the children in this community, children who may be spending their days home alone or you know haven't been out, been able to go and see friends or do any activity outside of their home this year. It's a very uncertain time. And so it is especially important for us to show them love this year. And then also to share Jesus with the people of our community. You know, and we get to do that this year through the track that they'll get in their bag and through a gospel CD that they will get that will have the presentation from us on there. That's right. So we're trying in all ways to minister to the entire family. So as a parent, how do you, how do you minister to a, to a parent? It's always through their children. When they see their children receiving joy um, from the Lord Jesus Christ, it will change them, it will soften their hearts, and then the opportunity to come in with the gospel. You remember last year we had the gospel tent, and through that ministry we saw over 250 people come through and hear that Jesus loves them and offers his salvation to them. What a wonderful opportunity. So it's not about booths, it's not about hot dogs, it is about Jesus and the work that he will do in their lives. What's awesome about, awesome about this opportunity is that when they go from here, they will continue to have that CD. And think about that man or that woman or that boy or that girl who later thinks about God's Word. They can go back to that CD and receive Jesus Christ right there in their home. So church, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for the support that you've given us. We need you to sign up for booths. You know these things that we need. We just ask that you make it a matter of prayer and ask the Lord how He wants you to serve for Fall Festival. We're so thankful that you have joined us and we trust that the time of worship together today will be valuable in your life and will minister to you as only God can do through the technology that we use. But thank you for joining us.
I remind you that next Sunday we'll begin Sunday school. It will take place at 10 o'clock, right after the morning worship service. And how long it will be at 10 o'clock and the worship will be at 9 o'clock, we do not know. But for right now, that's the schedule we're going to follow. And let me encourage you to come prepared to stay for your Sunday school class. All classes will meet in the same room where they had been meeting before, with the exception of the class that Brother Stan is leading and his department, and you will report to the choir room right behind us, the choir room, and that's where your class will be. That room is large enough where you can practice social distancing, and uh, we'll look forward to all of you being in Sunday school. Our senior adult ladies class upstairs will meet out in the assembly area rather than in your small room so that there's room for you to practice social distancing also. And we look forward to that time of being back together, fellowshipping together in our classrooms and also to study the Word of God together. I know you're excited about that. As we begin today, we want to do so with a word of prayer, thanking God for His presence, for His blessings, and uh, asking Him to lead and guide us and bless in this time. Would you join your heart with mine? Father, we're thankful to be in this place today, and for those who are joining us through technology, we're so thankful that we can worship together. And Lord, I pray those that are watching at home and being a part of our worship, they will feel like they're a part of who we are, right where we are. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit may speak to all of us through this time of worship. We continue to pray for those who have been affected by the storms along our, the Gulf Coast. Lord, it just seems to be one after another. And so many lives are affected, so much property damage so many people displaced and we pray for them and for the workers that go from Alabama and all of the surrounding states and many of them being a part of Southern Baptist work and Alabama Baptist work and we pray for their safety and that you will continue to use them in those places as they minister there. But more than anything else, we pray for their opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus and that you might speak to hearts. And as a result of this catastrophe, souls may be saved and lives changed. And folks that have no hope will find hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. As we gather in this place today, speak through your preacher of the hour. Lord, as we lift our voices in worship, I pray that you'll inhabit the praise of your people. And this will be a great experience as we worship together. And we thank you for what you're going to say to us and how you're going to lead us. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, uh, let's try again. Good morning, church. It's so good to welcome you here this morning. I'm excited about the opportunity to lead worship this morning uh, in Tommy's absence. Uh, thankful for the opportunity I've had to work with this group uh, here on the platform and also our worship techs. Uh, they all do a tremendous job, and we're going to enjoy a time of worship this morning. I want you to sing from your hearts. Uh, been thinking about grace a little bit this week, well, actually a lot, and uh, was reading some things last night, and uh, somebody brought out the fact that there's nothing that you or I can do uh, to deserve grace. We can't go around bragging and boasting that we have done something to deserve grace. Grace is God's gift, and I want us to celebrate that gift in our lives this morning. Uh, first, by reading this scripture out of Ephesians 2. Read it with me. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace. 
grace that is greater than all our sin. Stand as we sing together. Great is your faithfulness, O oh God. You wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. And your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace. Grace that taught my heart 
to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion me as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior. dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever
Thank you. Be seated. If you would turn with me in your scriptures uh, to the gospel is recorded. By John. You'll turn to the very first chapter of John, and we'll be getting to that in a few minutes. Maybe a long few minutes, okay? <laughs> The older I get, the more I realize as I'm in conversations with folks in the community and in other places and sometimes even within our church, how very unlearned our culture is today as to who Jesus is, who he really is, and what he has really done for us by his coming from heaven to earth and living a sinless, perfect life, and then giving himself as a sacrifice on the cross of Calvary, there are so many who do not understand what that really is all about. And then others within the church even do not understand that Jesus is actually revealed in every book of the Bible, from Genesis all the way through the Revelation. It is a book about him. As we study the Word of God, we need to be keenly aware that he was foretold of his coming, that types of him are presented throughout the Old Testament, and that he fulfilled every type of him, every portrait of him, everything that was taught about him coming was fulfilled in the life and the ministry and the death and the resurrection and the ascension and the promise coming again of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, please don't take me as being critical of special days because I, lo I love special days. I really do. I love Christmas. I, 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 I adore the time of the year. I, I love Easter. I, I love all of the other things. But I'm convinced that so many people only know about the birth of baby Jesus in chapter, the first chapters of the book of Luke. I'm afraid so many may just have heard the story of him at the age of 12 teaching in the temple and being left behind by his mother Mary and her husband Joseph and they had to come back searching for him but it, he told her that it was time for him to be about his father's business. They're just so that many just know about that and, and they know that he entered into his earthly ministry at the age of 30 and it lasted for three years until his crucifixion at the age of 33. Many could tell you that he was baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptizer is what his name actually means. He is John and, and Jesus was baptized by him. Many could tell you about some of the things that he taught during his three years. Many can say he did miracles and he did good for others, that he raised folks from the dead and healed those who were hurting. They can tell you that he died on the cross, and they can tell you that on Easter we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Of course, that is a short list of the events in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly life. Do we, but do we understand that his 33 years of being on this earth is just a very small time of who he is and what he has done through the history of the world? He is presented in the book of Genesis time and time again. And he's presented in the books of the Old Testament all the way through the Old Testament 
And then you come to the New Testament, even the New Testament writers after the four Gospels talk about Jesus and reveal who he is and what he's done for us and even add a deeper understanding and meaning of what he's done through his death, burial, resurrection, and his promise to come back and what he has done by giving us the Holy Spirit who indwells every believer to guide us and to teach us and to help us in our earthly walk as we serve the Lord. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are their testimonies breathed by the Holy Spirit concerning the time of his birth through his ascension after his resurrection. As these four men were used as human instruments to write these truths concerning the earthly ministry and life of our Savior, I'm so thankful that God has given us these Gospels, four accounts of the life and ministry of Jesus, so that we might believe in him, trust in him, and have an understanding of why he came and what he has accomplished through his coming to earth. I'm also thankful for the other writers of the New Testament who help us to become disciples of Jesus. The Gospels present him and his sacrifice and his death, burial, and resurrection, and they present him in the Gospel as he shares with everyone who would trust in him that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And they introduce the Gospel to us, and we use that Gospel message to preach and teach and to reach a lost world for the Lord Jesus Christ. And many have been called into evangelism. And I think back on the Dr. Billy Graham who preached all of those years, the simple gospel week after week after week, crusade after crusade, never varied from that. Now, some of his books and writings were much deeper than that and helped you in your Christian walk and understanding of the scriptures. But in his preaching in the crusades, he stayed true to sharing the good news of Jesus, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and invited men and women and boys and girls everywhere he preached to come to faith in Christ. And through that ministry, there are countless souls that were birthed into the kingdom of God. And I'm thankful for that kind of preaching and that kind of teaching. We're to be likewise that kind of a Christian. We're not given the pulpit as Billy Graham was. We're not given the crusades. We're not given the crowds. But we are given relationships in this life. And it is our privilege to share the truth of the gospel with those that live around us, those that we work with, those that we're in school with. It is our privilege to share the good news of Jesus with other folk. The writers of the New Testament after the Gospels elaborated on the finished work of salvation. And as I said, they further help us to grow in our faith and in our obedience in following the will of God for our lives. That's where the local pastor comes in. He is to preach the gospel, and I do preach the gospel. I do preach the the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, his, his life, his sinless life, his persecution, his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension into heaven, his ministry now among us, and that he's coming again. I never fail to preach that truth, but I'm thankful for the other New Testament writers that give us some depth to our spiritual walk and an understanding what it means to grow in Christ and to grow spiritually and mature in that relationship that began when we invited him into our hearts and lives to be our Lord and Savior. And they help us to understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and our lives, in our growth and spiritual maturity. Those writers of the New Testament give us that kind of an understanding. They teach us, encourage us, and even admonish us in our spiritual walk and growth. But only in that we read and study the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit of God apply the truth of the Word of God in our own hearts and lives that He may direct our paths and that His will may be done in each of our lives. 
As we study the Scripture, we are to recognize that all Scripture is God-breathed. It is absolutely the infallible Word of God. And we're to understand that it's recorded through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, and these men received these truths and recorded these truths, and they're given for us to grow in our knowledge of who he is and what he's done for us. The central person in all of this book, from Genesis through Revelation, the central personality, the one who is revealed in all Scripture is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. God made sure that we could find him throughout the Word of God and we could understand the truth of who he is and why he came. Whether you're reading in the New Testament or the Old Testament, it is all about Jesus. When Jesus said, I am the truth, he was not merely stating that he was truthful in his dealings. He was stating that he is the definition of truth. He came to bring us the truth, and the Scripture is the truth that reveals him, and it's about him. The writers in the, of the Old and New Testament have not given us truths that are innately of themselves, but rather truth that is revealed and taught to them by the Holy Spirit or experienced by them. For instance, all members of the human race can only know truth as taught by others to them and experience as truth that is discovered, but it was already there. For instance, I give you Paul's writings. Many times, he gave it a statement of his pedigree. As he would go from town to town on his missionary journeys, there would be those who would raise eyebrows and others would raise their fist and, and others made all kinds of derogatory comments about him and who he was. But Paul would often remind them of his pedigree, that he was a Jew with all of the rights. He was educated as a Jew. He had been educated by scholars. He had been educated by the rabbis and priests. He knew Jewish law. He knew Old Testament very thoroughly. And he would stand before them and say, listen, I don't speak out of ignorance. I speak of one who has been educated, who has experienced the law. I've walked in those things. I've taught those things. And I have a message to tell you of the one who has fulfilled all of those things. He often spoke of his background as both a, a well-educated Jew and one who was well-learned in the Jewish laws and scriptures. This was to gain an ear. That was his way of getting a listening audience, that he was not an unlearned, babbling, ignorant man, but he did have the pedigree. But every bit of his knowledge Paul, in all that he wrote in the New Testament, every bit of his knowledge he gained from someone else or from his personal experience in experiencing that knowledge. With only his personal encounter and resulting relationship with Jesus being his claim to spiritual knowledge and understanding. He never made any claim in all of his teachings and all of his writings that he was some super Christian hero, that he was given knowledge, he, he was given experience that was only for him and no one else could know these things. He did not claim that innately, and I use that word again, that naturally, innately born with him was all of this stuff that he was expounding upon. He is saying, I'm a learned man, I'm an educated man, but let me tell you, what I'm going to tell you about is truth that I've learned, already existed, already had been disclosed, and I've learned it, and I'm giving you a spiritual understanding of that knowledge. 
But on the contrary, and I use Paul as just an example of a New Testament writer. On the contrary, Jesus said, I am the truth. He is truth. He spoke with absolute knowledge because he is absolute knowledge. Truth is who he is, God incarnate, God clothed in flesh of the human race. He is the God of creation, the God of salvation, praise God. John opens up the gospel of John in the first chapter, and I hope you have your Bibles open to that. He opened up the first chapter of John that he is the God of creation. This is what he said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And then you go down to verse 14, and he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In the very first chapter of Genesis, we find the record of God's creation. As we read about it, we are confronted with the truth that God created all things and he did it not the way that it's presented many times. Folks will talk about he flung out the stars with his hand, that he carved the rivers in the earth. No, if you read the account of creation according to the word of God, God spoke it in existence. God says, let there be and there was. And what we find out when we turn to the gospel of John that John says he is the one who created all things. I want you to notice that God created everything as it's given to us in the book of Genesis through the spoken word. He created it through the word. And then we get to John, and John says of Jesus that he is the word. He said he is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And he says, and the Word became flesh, in verse 14. The same one that he talks about becoming flesh and dwelling among us, that same Jesus that, that, Jesus that was born in Bethlehem of Judea, that same Jesus that went to the cross and died on the cross for us, that was buried and rose again, that same Jesus is the one that John opens up the gospel describing him as the word of God that spoke everything into existence. In other words, Jesus is the creator. He is the word. And we, when we understand that about that, we are confronted with the truth of who God exposes himself as being as he spoke everything to existence. That is with the exception of, and I wouldn't want to leave this out and somebody come up and say, well, let me tell you one thing he didn't speak into existence. That is with the exception of man. He did not speak man into existence. Instead, God meticulously and carefully formed man out of the dust of the earth. And it says that he formed man in his image and in his likeness. And breathed into man and he became a living what? A living soul. Mankind, the human race, is the only creation of God that has a soul. He breathed into us and we became a living soul. 
And you start with that beginning of Genesis and you go all the way through the Old Testament and all the way through the New Testament and you'll find over and over again a picture of who Jesus is and what he's done. And when John describes him as the Word made flesh and in the beginning was the Word and you turn to Genesis and find out it is the Word of God that created all things, we understand what John was saying. You with me? Jesus the creator. So we find in John 1 that the word became flesh. Jesus, the word. And yet scriptures are called the word of God. Isn't that interesting? So we come to the understanding that the Bible, the word of God, reveals Jesus, for he is the Word of God. For the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, I, I'm not trying to be something super special here, and, and I don't want to confuse you at all, but what we need to re remember, that when we study the Scriptures, we're to understand that the Scripture is given to us to reveal the Lord Jesus Christ, God's plan of redemption for fallen man by giving his only begotten son as the perfect, innocent, sinless sacrifice for our sins. You see, that was God's plan from the very beginning. And it was brought to fruition as we read about it in the New Testament through the virgin-born Son of God, the perfect Lamb of God, who came to take away the sins of the world by being sacrificed on the cross for our redemption and salvation. Even in the Old Testament, we can find the message of Jesus and word pictures of his ministry, his personality, of his sacrifice, of his work. We can find those pictures presented to us, word pictures in the Old Testament. You say, now preacher, where do you get that? How do you come up with that? Well, I got it from Jesus. If you want to turn to Luke, the gospel according to Luke in chapter 24, you'll understand what I'm talking about. You remember this is taking place after his resurrection. And he joins two of his followers, disciples, on the road to Emmaus. They're traveling home. They've given up. And Jesus just comes up beside him, and he does not reveal himself as who he is, and he starts a conversation with them. And th th he said, I, I sense something is troubling you. He says, you mean you have been in these, this area and, and you don't, haven't heard? You don't know? Our Lord, Jesus, was crucified. They put him to death. And some of the ladies came this morning and said that he's risen. They went to the tomb and it was empty and that he's alive again. But we've not seen any of that. We've not heard of that. We are just rejected and dejected and we don't know what we're going to do. They didn't even know that the Word of God was walking with them. They didn't even realize that it was the one who had been crucified on the cross for their sins, was resurrected, and was walking with them as a resurrected living Lord. Matter of fact, it wasn't even until he got into their home when they asked him, why don't you just stay here and have a meal with us and stay here tonight and rest? And he agreed to go to their home. And when he's sitting in the room with them, it says, and he took the bread and broke it. And when he broke the bread, he revealed himself by doing such to those followers that he was indeed Jesus. But listen to what he says in beginning with verse 25 of the 24th chapter of Luke. Then he said to them, 
Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Here it is. And beginning with Moses, or at Moses, and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. And then I go back down to the 30th verse. He says, now it came to pass as he sat at the table with them that he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Jesus said, All the scriptures are about him. Beginning with Moses, now I'll remind you that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So when you go back to the writings of Moses, where does it begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it says that when Jesus was talking with them, he went all the way back to the writings of Moses and came up through the Scriptures. That must have been some kind of lesson. Can you imagine that? We're talking about the one who's revealing himself. Remember, he is the Word made flesh. And there's not anything in the Word of God that he does not know perfectly, perfectly experienced it, perfectly uh, spoke it, and he knows everything that he's telling them. And it says he starts with Moses and walks through those books of the Pentateuch and he goes into the prophets and the prophets and all the scriptures and he tells them things about himself that were written by Moses and the prophets. We cannot look at all those word pictures that are given in the Old Testament about Jesus But we're going to look at some of them in the next few weeks. I truly believe. Now, let me say this. I don't want to be accused of not telling the truth. I used a a word very loosely there, the next few weeks. You know, if you've heard a preacher very many times, you know when he says, I'm not going to keep you but a few minutes, that doesn't necessarily mean a short time. And it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to finish it in four, five, six weeks. But in the next week, we're going to be looking at some of those things. I truly believe that this series of messages, hear me, I truly believe with all of my heart that these, this series of messages could well be the greatest contribution of my ministry as your pastor and your teacher. I encourage you to not miss a service. If you have to miss, go to our website during the week and listen to it. And we're going to grow together. We're going to study together. We're going to have our minds and our spiritual man enlightened as to what the New Old Testament, excuse me, and the New Testament, but what the Old Testament reveals to us about the person, the work, ministry, and power of the Son of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps this is new to you. Perhaps this kind of biblical preaching is new to you. It shouldn't be if you've been under my preaching for these 21 years. You know, many times I will use Old Testament passages to present the gospel and talk about Jesus. Let me encourage you. You will grow in knowledge of the Word of God, and you will come to an understanding of how the entire Bible is about Jesus about his coming, about his sacrifice, his resurrection, his ascension, 
and even his coming again is foretold and talked about in the Old Testament, and we'll discover that as we walk through this together. I tell you what, when I think about it, it just won't, makes me want to shout. But I'm much too Baptist for that. It makes me want to shout, hallelujah, oh, what a Savior. That God would go to such lengths to make sure that who he is, why he came, what he has accomplished, and what his promises are to us are revealed even long before he came. But the sadness is, the scripture says that he came unto his own, and they received him not. Oh, let that not be true of us. May we not walk and live in ignorance about who Jesus is and what he's done. Let us not live in ignorance concerning the things of Jesus in the Old Testament. But let's walk through this together, discovering and trusting. Let me give you two incidences where Jesus referred to the Old Testament as being about him. He said... In the third chapter of John, he's talking to Nicodemus. Right before, right before, two verses before, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Two verses before that. In verse 14, he says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus was telling us right there. That pointed to me. That was a picture of my work. That was a picture of my death on the cross. That was a picture, a beautiful portrait of God's plan of redemption that was given by Moses in the lifting up the serpent. The other time is in Matthew chapter 12. And he talks about Jonah. He says, and as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so must the Son of Man, that Jesus often referred to himself as the Son of Man, spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, talking about his burial and his resurrection, only three days and nights. Jesus said that was foretold. Jonah is a lesson about me. It is a, Jonah is a picture of me that he came forth after being buried in the sea, and I'm going to be buried, and I'll come to life. I'll rise again. That's just two incidences. I hope that whets your appetite. hope that encourages you, that you can find Jesus throughout the Scriptures, for he is the Word, thus the Word about him all the time. If you've never come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, as he has revealed to you this morning in the few things I've shared, if you've never come to faith in him, what a great opportunity for you to trust him as your Lord and Savior and to be gloriously born again, birthed into the family of God to become a child of God, to be saved, if you would, and to have a home for eternity in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful for your word. Lord, we're so thankful that you planned way, way, way before you ever even made man that you had a way of his salvation. You had a plan to redeem him, for you knew the choices that he would make. Father, we thank you that you give us that beautiful picture and story of your redemptive plan all the way through your word. Help us to grow in it. Help us to allow you to teach us. And Lord, may we be humble 
and thankful that you have presented it to us and you have completed it in the coming of the, and the death and burial and resurrection of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Lord, if there's one in this place who does not know you personally, Lord, move on their heart and help them to come to faith in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand together. If I can pray with you, I'll be more than glad to do it. On your way out, may I remind you that you may come by and get one of the boxes for Operation Christmas Child as that is beginning now. It's our kickoff day for that. May I remind you to speak to Stephanie if you would like to be a part of our fall festival and, and have a place, a booth, a car trunk, whatever, uh, for that special event. If you'd like to work in some other area to help someone else, we'd love to have you do that. And don't forget the offering boxes on the way out on either side of the door. And you may place your offering in those offering boxes as you depart today. Thank you for being here. I remind our youth you have Sunday school starting right now. God bless you. I love you. See you later.